Hey everybody, Keith Burns and Dale Strickler with Green Cover Seed here, and we've got some really cool things to show you. Uh, this is our experiment into kind of a planting green and planting into massive amounts of cover. Uh, what we're standing in here is a rye uh, hairy vetch combination that was planted uh, last uh, fall, and actually the the vetch was actually planted in the end of July with buckwheat because we double cropped that Dale after we harvested spring triticale. If you remember, we had a big spring triticale <laughs> crop out here and then we double cropped buckwheat and we put 15 pounds of hairy vetch in with the buckwheat. We harvested the buckwheat the first week in October uh, and then we came in and we planted rye into that. So the vetch has actually been going since the end of July. Uh, about 15 pounds of that, and then the rye was seeded after buckwheat harvest. So the result of all that is this massive amount of biomass that we're looking at here. Uh, what, what would you estimate is here, Dale, for, for dry matter and just overall tonnage? I, I would guess just eyeballing this, there's probably about three tons out here. Um, and fair percentage of, of hairy vetch, of course, uh, um, this can accomplish several things number one weed control mm -hmm. um and erosion control uh, i mean we had how, how how hard did the wind blow here the other night well, that's probably 40 50 mile an hour winds yeah and dust blowing everywhere yep. and uh you know complete soil protection here and when you part the canopy there are no weeds yeah, no weeds uh, down no there. weeds underneath and then um once this is terminated and put down on the ground that soil protection remains um, in addition uh, both rye and vetch contain allelopathic compounds that uh, keep controlling weeds even after they're dead the mulch prevents weed seedlings from getting sunlight and this vetch uh, being a legume it's a great nitrogen fixer I don't know what percent of the biomass it is here. We'll have an analysis later. To tell yeah, us we sent we sent two tests into Ward Labs yesterday. Right. How much of the nitrogen or how much nitrogen is contained in this biomass? We can get a reasonable estimate of how much nitrogen will be released. But uh, one nice thing about the nitrogen in this form is it's it's not in the form of nitrate. Mm -hmm. And uh, I was taught in school that. You know, you want nitrate for your plants. Now we're finding out that nitrate, even though it gets into plants easily, we really don't want plants taking up a lot of their nitrogen in the form of nitrate. We'd prefer that they take it up as ammonium or intact amino acids. There's some real benefits yeah. to having your nitrogen in an organic form that's slow release. I think some of John Kemp's work shows that when it's in the nitrate form, the plant has to expend a lot more energy to convert right. it to that ammonia form. So if you can have it in that or an amino acid form, it's much easier. The plant has to expend far less resources converting right. it, then that's more energy for it to grow. Yeah, if you think about what's going on in the soil, uh, like this is, this is nitrogen in the form of protein, when that goes in the soil, there are microbes that take that protein, use it as an energy source, and kick out amino acids. Mm -hmm. There are other microbes that take those amino acids, use them as an energy source, so they're pulling energy out, kick out ammonium. And then there's another bacteria that takes ammonium, takes energy out of it, and kicks yeah. out nitrite. And then another bacteria that takes nitrite, pulls energy out, and creates nitrate. And that's... And, and we we were taught that that's the nitrogen that plants want because it moves it's the form of nitrogen that moves with water yeah. and gets into the plant well if you've got a plant with a very limited root system and no mycorrhizal fungi that that's important to have nitrogen that moves with water or limited water supply right and, and so but once that nitrate gets into the plant then the plant has to add nit had has to add energy to change it to nitrite, more energy to change the nitrite to ammonium, and then a bunch of energy, mm -hmm. I mean a lot of energy to change that ammonium into an amino acid, and then more energy yet to change it into protein. If you can just have start, a setup- Start with protein start, to begin start with. Start with protein to begin <laughs> with. Just just use the protein yeah. and, and you don't have to, the plant doesn't have to expend all that energy. Plus, 
most weeds have to have the nitrate. They are, are weeds fulfill an ecological niche of bare soil, disturbed soil. They are nature's scab. And because of that, they, um, they are adapted to use nitrogen in the nitrate form. Yeah. And if you do not have an abundance of nitrate in the ni uh, nitrogen in the nitrate form in a field, weeds just don't do well. They just don't grow well. So bare soils and a lot of nitrates, you're just asking for a weed issue yeah. and asking you shall receive. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Most yeah. people get what they're asking for when it and, comes yes. to that. And, and so of weeds. if you can provide this as a combination, I mean, to me, this is the ultimate weed and feed. Mm -hmm. This is much better weed and feed than than uh, pendimethylin coated uh, uh, urea. Um, this is going to provide weed control and slow release nitrogen yeah. in the protein slash amino acid form that uh, we'd prefer that our plants have. Because I'm gonna go out on a limb here and I'm gonna estimate what I'm seeing here. I'm gonna say this is probably somewhere between 120 and 140 pounds of nitrogen is what this is gonna return. And we'll have those results back from the lab soon. Yes. And about half of that's probably yeah, going to be available. Carbon nitrogen ratio, my guess, is going to be around 22, 25 in this, which right. means a half that's probably going to come available. Yeah. And um, the uh, in that carbon nitrogen range, that, like you said, uh, you got to remember, uh, in the soil, the microbes always sit at the table first. Mm -hmm. So they're going to incorporate what nitrogen they need to meet their needs and then they will in turn be consumed by nematodes and, and uh, beneficial nematodes, protozoans, and they're going to kick out amino acids and ammonium that the plants can then utilize. Yeah, so in other words, this system would still work very good for weed control if I didn't have a lot of biology, but from cycling the nutrients and providing nitrogen for this next crop that's coming, it's not gonna be nearly as effective if I don't have a big right. biological bank down here, which we've been building on this farm because we've been doing no-till and we've mm -hmm. been doing cover crops. And like I say, this had actually three crops planted on it just last year, the, the triticale, the buckwheat, the, the vetch, and well, four actually, and then the rye. So we mm -hmm. have four different crops growing here. So we're pretty confident in how much biology we have, and it'll be really interesting. Uh, we'll do periodic updates to see how fast all of this massive amount of biomass mm -hmm. disappears in cycles. Yeah. It, and uh, <laughs> uh, the, the people watching this video, uh, and unfortunately, there's no way we convey the way it smells or sounds yeah or, i mean just the, yeah, buzz. the, the smell it's, is, it's like a freshly mown alfalfa field yes when we look at the what's been rolled down it's it's pretty amazing and then you know when when we were out here planting this and we have some good footage of, of it being rolled uh, i commented to davis i said i think there's 20 pounds an acre of nitrogen out here just in the insects, insects. <laughs> i mean it was just a swarm as that yeah. roller went through it was just a swarm. Now, unfortunately, a lot of those are mosquitoes yeah. <laughs> that, are, that are still here. Yeah, if we could. But if there's, we could. there's bees and wasps and all sorts of other things just flying all over uh, in this small strip that we left for this demonstration. Well, and, and something you mentioned is, is uh, kind of unusual that uh, I, I read something last night and they talked about what percentage of the phosphorus in the Great Plains soils originated um, not from the rocks that are here, uh, which contain very little phosphorus, or the geologic material. Mm -hmm. It came from the manure of seabirds mm -hmm. that migrated in from the Gulf of Mexico annually and just deposited. And so, yeah, animal animal migration yeah. uh, and animal impact, whether it's insects or birds or whatever, does have an effect on your soil. And insects probably much more so than birds. Because an insect is just a flying package of nutrients. Yeah, <laughs> so yes, You it can is. cycle that back through your system so oh, much yeah. the better. Yeah, so. Yeah, and and you know, just from a from a maturity standpoint, now we're we're shooting this video, I think it's June 11th. So it's it's getting pretty late. Uh, what we're going to look at these fields that have been planted a little earlier. We had a cold spring, so uh -huh. this was all kind of slowed down from that cold spring. 
Normally, we would want to hope to see rye and vetch at this stage, ideally around the third week in May, mm -hmm. you know, so that you could roll and plant in that time frame. It's getting a little late. And this, this certainly is a little beyond uh, what is prime rolling. I mean, the rye has already shed its pollen. There's no more pollen on here. If you look at this vetch, you know, it's starting to form seed pods and it's starting mm -hmm. to put seed in those pods. So the, the ideal rolling time for this was probably seven to 10 days ago. Um, and, and that's when a lot of this that we're going to look at here was planted and it worked pretty well. Uh, but we did want to leave this as a demonstration and we'll, we'll come in here and plant something in the strip, yeah. uh, and see how well it rolls down. And I think a lot of the value, you know, we've talked a lot about, uh, companion cropping and, uh, you know, interseeding uh, corn in 60 inch rows and then planting companion crops in between or, or corn in 30 inch rows and planting companion crops or cover crops interseeded in between. And one of the biggest obstacles to people doing that is, well, there's no way I can control the weeds because we have this, mm -hmm. you know, our only weed control is either tillage, which we don't promote, sure. or chemistry. Yep. And they, they Cause both of them are disturbances. Both right. of them are cost money. Right. And, and so, um, how can you plant a corn crop or a sunflower crop or whatever crop that you want to provide companions with and without herbicides? Yeah. Well, here you go. Yeah. Weed and feed. Weed and feed. Yeah. Talking about the weed control portion. Uh, th this is a spot that, uh, we clipped Davis clipped this and this is what we sent into ward labs. Uh, so we could get an accurate test of how much nitrogen, how much carbon, C to N ratio, biomass, and all that. So this has had all the residue removed. But I mean, look at that. There's there's not a there's not a weed in there anywhere. Uh, he clipped this just a few days ago. But you can see that there's good residue there from the previous uh, triticale crop. And little lady, our little ladybug right there. There's our insecticide too. <laughs> so yeah, yep. Natural natural insect control with insects. So. Uh, yeah, very impressive. You know, this, the, the holy grail of soil health, I've always said the whole, holy grail of soil health is organic no-till. Uh, this type of system makes me think that that is uh, much more possible than I ever thought before. Okay, Dale, so this this right here, what what we have is what we were just standing in with all that mm -hmm. biomass this this is friday this was planted tuesday uh so you know what four days ago and uh, what they did here uh this this is a field uh we have a little five acre patch here where we're doing russian mammoth sunflowers so <laughs> the sunflowers they're supposed to get like 10 feet high and have the huge heads uh, well we're trying to grow some of those so what we did is we came in here with our planter uh, John Deere stacker planter. This year we put the Dawn ZRX uh, rollers, crop rollers on it. So that ran through, planted the sunflowers in 30 inch rows. And then after that, we came back through with the air seeder with seven and a half inch disc spacings and we seeded our companion crops. So there's clover and there's buckwheat and there's flax and there's mung beans and uh, all manner of other types of things that will grow in the understory here. And this has had no herbicides on it. This probably hasn't had any herbicides on it since uh, probably a year and a half. And so this vetch in the rye has been completely killed just mechanically, but it took two passes to really do this. So we'll look at another field where it just had that planter and the rollers. There's so much biomass, those ZRX rollers, I don't think we had enough weight on our planter. We didn't have enough down pressure to completely kill it in a crimp. Uh -huh. But the combination of the planter and the crimpers and then the drill with a disc roll in every seven and a half inches was very effective. I'm, I'm gonna say, you know, we're gonna have a 99.5% kill on all of this biomass here. Mm -hmm. And when we look at it, go ahead and let's pull this back. Yeah. I mean, it just looks like you you took alfalfa slabs and laid out here. Yeah, yeah I, I've planted a garden and I've just taken flakes of alfalfa hay mm -hmm. and laid it, and we've got a seven and a half inch wide flake of alfalfa hay essentially here, except it's rye and vetch cover crop. So we didn't have to buy it and, and break it apart and put it here. This was all done during the planting process. Yes. This is not a separate operation from the planting, 
this was all accomplished at planning. And this is, <laughs> we were talking earlier how this is like lasagna. You've got a layer of yep. pasta here, and then you've got last year's. If you, you can pull this up, there's last year's pasta here. <laughs> and, and then if you, you look at this crumbly stuff, that was the previous year's pasta last year's pasta <laughs> this year's last year's so the crumbly stuff has to be the ground beef we can't we can't have <laughs> vegan lasagna here dale oh, we gotta no, have some no. meat somewhere right we we have to have our carnivorous part there uh the the maybe the meat's all the microbes that are <laughs> eating be. eating the vegan yeah. stuff so. so again this essentially this, this is not organic because it's not certified organic but it's going to be grown essentially with no chemicals yeah. and no, no, I don't think we'll need any fertility inputs on this. There should be sufficient nitrogen here. You know, if we were estimating 120 to 140, if we can get half of that to release, mm -hmm. uh, plus with the other biology and the, the great efficiency of this type of nitrogen, that should be enough nitrogen to grow a pretty good sunflower crop. Now, what we will do here, uh, we will run some nitrogen strips through this mm -hmm. to see if added nitrogen did help with yield yeah. or if it didn't make any difference we'll do some strips and, and test that theory to, yeah. to see if if we have enough or if we're leaving yield on the table out there by not having and, and some observations from people that have done stuff like this is that if you do this one year you know like you said there's probably going to be about 140 pounds of total nitrogen in this 120 and about half that's going to be available that's not enough to raise a 200 bushel sure. corn crop by itself but if you do this year after year yeah. or something similar to this, mm -hmm. you get half of last year's, a quarter of the years before, an eighth of the year before. Yeah. You know, you add all those fractions together and you start a buildup. Yeah. And uh, we're, you, we're banking things. Yes. And you're building not just the legumes but also the free-living nitrogen-fixing bacteria, the azotobacter, the azospirillum, the bayerinka, all those organisms start to thrive in the absence of soluble nitrate fertilizer. Mm -hmm. And um, you can start getting biology to creating fertility for plus, you. Plus the fact that, again, as we talked about, this, this nitrogen being in the protein and amino acid form, it's going to be much more efficient getting into the plant than, you know, so I wouldn't have to put 200 pounds of nitrogen out if it's in the right form. You probably only need 120 to 130 to there, produce 200 bushel corn. There's some evidence of that. Yeah. yeah. And, you know, when the, the plant, because it's expending less of its energy uh, to, up, I guess, uh, upgrade the, the nitrate into amino acids. Yeah. More of that... Uh, energy produced through photosynthesis is available for root exudates to feed free living nitrogen. Yeah. So here's so here's kind of the double edged sword of this though. Because this is has a fairly low carbon nitrogen ratio, that's a good thing in the fact that it's going to cycle quickly and this nitrogen is going to be available for this crop of sunflowers. The bad side, the flip side to that is this is going to cycle pretty quickly and the residue is going to disappear, open me, opening me up to, to weeds coming. So that's the reason that we planted this twice, once with the sunflowers and the second time with the companion crops. Right. Because we know that this residue is going to be excellent weed control here for the next probably 30 to 45 days. Yes. But and, after and that, that's enough to get the after crop that, up. it's going to start disappearing, cycling. That's what we want. That's what you need. But you have, we have to replace that with something. Right. Otherwise, I'm going to have, there's, there's plenty of weed bank out here. Uh, and those weeds would come if we give them an opportunity. So that's where we're hoping our companion crops will fill in and we'll have a second layer of a canopy coming, uh, a living canopy this time. Mm -hmm. And we, we selected things that will stay relatively short, uh, relatively low water users. Um, and then the sunflowers, of course, will get yeah. tall and we can harvest them and have that companion growing down below. Yeah. And, you know, one way of looking at weeds, we, weeds are a sign from God that we are not using all the sunlight and the moisture and the soil nutrients. He's speaking that, pretty loudly that, lately. That, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> he said, use more of what I'm giving you. Come on. Um, yeah, I mean, they're, they're a sign that we are not using, fully utilizing the resources provided to us. Yeah. People out west say, well, we can't grow anything in wheat stubble. 
said, well, if nothing grows in weed stubble, why are you running your sprayers out there four times? <laughs> you know, the weeds yeah. are a sign of unutilized yep. resources. So um, anytime you've got a cropping system situation where you've got weeds growing, that's a sign that you need to increase your cropping intensity. Yeah. There's resources that you need to be taken advantage of. If you don't take advantage of it, weeds will. Yep. And the gaps in between our crops may be one of those things. So, so we put something in here on purpose to take advantage because we know that this is going to yeah. break down in about 30 days. Mm -hmm. and, and then if we don't plant something there, we'll be getting weeds. Yeah. Dale, now we're we're looking at a little patch that we planted in our milpa garden. Uh -huh. uh, we've talked a lot about the milpa garden concept, and we've tried it for several years, uh, and it had mixed success, mostly because weeds just always came in and just uh -huh. kind of took over. Uh, so this year we we tried to be a little more intentional. We planned a little bit better, and where we planted this milpa garden was into that that big biomass uh, cover crop that we looked at earlier. So we probably laid down three plus tons of dry matter here. Uh, and again, this, there, there's no, this was no herbicide here at all. This was just drilled. Now, some of this probably got drilled twice because um, a couple reasons we didn't have the drill set right. <laughs> uh, we need a drill calibration video. Uh, but the other reason is sometimes, especially if you're on a small patch, it's not a bad idea to cut your seeding rate in half and drill it twice if you're trying to get that roller crimper effect. Yes. Because this is 100% kill uh, on all that rye and all that vetch. Uh, and this has been planted longer than the one we were just in. So there's nothing green here anymore because this has been in the ground for probably, oh, 10 to 14 days. Mm -hmm. And uh, we've got stuff emerging. There's a fairly good size uh, plant right there, a pumpkin or a squash of, of some variety. And uh, so, so this has been long enough to where we're confident that again, we've got a very good kill uh, on all that cover. Now there's there's a few things that aren't completely dead and, and that's okay. I mean, it'll add to the diversity of the milpa, but I'm confident uh, that we're gonna have far better weed suppression and control, probably not 100%, but far better than we've ever had before by doing it like this. Uh -huh. Yeah, and, and you can see some of the other benefits. Of course, we have the, the bird's nest there. <laughs> the bird's nest, right? And if look, you look how it's just integrated right into the to the straw right there yeah and you know people talk about i i hear from people a lot of times especially in the corn belt people in iowa they talk about there's no pheasants anymore why are there no pheasants anymore in iowa well where's a pheasant going to nest in iowa now yeah. it's corn soybeans in the spring you know pheasants nest in may there's nothing yeah it, it's it's corn beans bare ground and they went from planting fence row to fence row to taking the fence rows out. So there's yes. not even a fence row anymore. There's not even a fence row anymore. It's just, uh, you know, you plant right up, overlap the neighbor's field, and, and then the first one to harvest gets that one extra <laughs> row at the edge of the field. And so um, there's no nesting habitat. And you think, well, big deal. Well, it is a big deal because I, we've probably all heard the story about how the Mormons... Uh, we're getting wiped out by Mormon crickets, and then the flocks of birds moved in and saved, saved, the, cro it. saved the crop. And without the flocks of birds, what do we do now? Yeah. Fog it with insecticide? And then, you know, and, and uh, one of the things when we first knelt down here, there was a big ground beetle crawling around here, and he, he's since hidden. That ground beetle is a predator of slugs. Mm -hmm. And so... The things that we harbor here, whether it's birds or, or ground beetles or wolf spiders or any of the other things here, you can create a habitat where it controls a lot of our problems. And if you listen, you can hear a lot of birds, even though we're not, there's, there's some trees around, but not super close, but there's birds right out in all this because those beetles yeah. are a food source for the birds then as well. Yep, and, and that one's very annoyed that we are out here and, and <laughs> interfering might, with her That home, might be right? her nest right here. <laughs> yeah, she's like, come on guys, you know, like, that's, my, that's my kid's home there. Uh, but yeah, so 
this this is creating a problem um and i i think it it's odd sometimes people say well can you give me a mix but i don't want anything too complicated i'm like why I said well i can't manage complicated I said no the more complex the mix gets the less management you, you have, have to do, to do. Yeah. It, it, when you get a diverse enough mix, you get a, a diverse enough system, um, you don't have to do anything. You don't have to spray in, uh, herbicides. You don't have to spray insecticides. It's not saying that yeah. you may never have to, but it really decreases the odds of any one thing becoming a big Taking issue. Taking over, yeah. yeah. And, and this... Uh, people say, well, when I have all that stuff mixed together, I can't pull weeds, I can't hoe weeds, I can't cultivate. I don't want to do that anyway. <laughs> right. I don't want to do that anyway. So let's set up a system where you don't have to, where weeds yeah. simply, you, you create the conditions where weeds do not thrive. Yeah. You know, thick mulch, nitrogen in the form of protein rather than soluble nitrogen. Okay, Dale, now we're, we're in the same field. Uh, again, all this biomass that, that got rolled down. Uh, this particular part of the field was planted, again, about four days ago, four or five days ago. Um, and this was not drilled, it was just planted. Uh, so this is popcorn that we're growing for to harvest for cover crop seed. And uh, so this was just hit with the planter and the Dawn ZRX rollers. And so, there's areas of it like this where we had almost a complete kill. Uh -huh. Look, looks really, really well. And then there's areas like over here where it, it just kind of dinged it up, but it's obviously coming back pretty well. So this section did get sprayed. I think they came in with some Liberty to, to just kind of knock the, the batch out. It's pretty amazing. 100% kill on the rye, I would say, from yeah. that roller. Uh -huh. But probably only, I don't know, 50% kill on the batch. I think had we, I don't think we had enough down pressure uh, because when you're running that roller on your planter, it's difficult to have enough down pressure for the rollers and all your planter units. Yes, it takes a lot of weight. If we'd have had just a regular dedicated cover crop roller, I think we would have got a better kill. Or like where we looked at where the sunflowers are growing, <clears throat> had we hit it with another pass with a air seeder or a drill and had another opportunity to cramp and roll and mash that down, uh, I think we would have seen yeah. a lot, a lot. The vetch is a bit of a finer stem than what the rye is, mm -hmm. so it, you gotta, it, it, like you said, needs a little more down pressure yeah. to get that good crimp action. Yeah, but but it's still very impressive. Uh, we, you know, again, same thing with the massive amounts of ground cover, uh, the smell, you know, because <laughs> all this vetch is just, you know, really sweet smelling. But what's impressive is that this this popcorn, uh, it's already up. Yeah. And it's only been, uh, I say, about a week, you know, maybe a week or so, and it's already up and going. And uh, one thing about planting late like this is that your corn does not set in the ground for 10, 14, you know, 20 days before it comes up. It gets up and it gets going fast. Yeah, yeah. So it's, by delaying your planting two or three weeks, you may only really be delaying your crop by half that time because yeah. it gets going so much faster in these warm soils. Yeah, and uh, you might save yourself some disease issues. Yeah, you don't cut, need treated seed if you're planting into warm, warm soils where it's coming up issues. like that. Yeah, there's some things you can get away from. And uh, So again, you wouldn't do this on all your fields, but you might consider the later planting on some fields uh, because there are benefits of doing that. Yeah, yeah, and, and again, diversity, you spread your risk out. Yeah. So, you know, again, this, this, this would not be, this is not going to be grown in an organic system because we did have to supplement some herbicide to, to help knock this out. Um, looking back, what, perhaps what we could have done, we could have maybe run the drill through here and uh, drilled the companion crop of clover. Mm -hmm. uh, in fact, we may, we may still try that on a strip or two here. There's nothing that says we can't do that. Um, Typically, we don't like to interseed into corn at the same time you plant the corn because of a competition issue. But clovers, I think, are slow enough coming. Yeah. If we didn't have the rate too high, I 
and especially the, all this residue would really slow a clover down. I think it'd still come, yeah. but it would come slowly. Yeah. Uh, so we may still try that uh, yeah. and just see how that works because you know that one two punch may be what it needs to really get this stuff terminated. Yeah, and, and uh, I don't necessarily want to farm organically myself, although it's getting more and more tempting because it looks like I can do it more and more feasibly. Yeah. yeah. Uh, but if you could do it without the tillage. Yeah, or I can with do very it. Little you know, and the big drawback uh, to me with organic farming has been I didn't want to do any tillage. Um, but if I can do organic farming without tillage and cash in on this premium and do a good job of weed control and providing fertility, uh, why not? Yeah. You know, it, at least I, I have the option. And even if I don't go do an organic farm, um, I have fewer inputs. I write fewer checks yeah. that appeals to all of us. Yeah. And you know, this isn't going to work perfectly every year. No, nothing no. ever does. I mean, no. there's no perfect system. And if, if we were doing this in an organic setting and we would have seen how, what kind of job that planter was doing, cause we knew that it was not going to kill this batch immediately just by the way that it looked. Um, so then we would have had to go to some sort of plan B, uh, which could have been, you know, just hitting it again with those rollers or like say running the drill through here to kind of chop it up and further crimp it. So there's other things we could have done had this been an organic situation without uh -huh. this batch. Because I guarantee you, if nothing had been done to this batch, it would continue to grow and it would severely hurt this corn <laughs> yield. In fact, it would, it would, there would probably It'd be probably literally zero the yield in these areas yeah. where this batch did not get killed. Yeah. But, you know, I think we've seen plenty of examples over the last 10 years where herbicides don't always work 100%. Yeah, that's right. Now we're standing in a strip of batch only uh, that nothing has been done to since uh, the buckwheat was harvested last October. And the, the reason this is here, the, the pivot sets right here and, and we didn't get any rye planted here last fall because the pivot was here uh, and we just didn't take the time to move it and swing it all the way out. So this is vetch by itself and, and a relatively thinner stand. It is only planted at about 15 pounds per acre. Mm -hmm. Normally, if we would plant vetch for seed production or something, we'd be 30 to 35 pounds seeding rate. So this is only about a half rate of vetch, but yet we've got a good stand. There's there's no weeds here whatsoever. But but one of the things that strikes me is how much shorter this vetch is than, than it was over there where it had the rye to kind of climb up. Now, there may be just as much vetch here because it is a very viney crop and, you know, it's yeah. all tangled together. And when you pull it up, I mean, there's there's a lot of vetch there, but it's just, it's flatter to the ground. So there's no doubt if, you, and there's not a big area here, so I don't know if we'll try to harvest it for seed. We might, uh, just to see how it works. This is gonna be hard to harvest because this, this is gonna be flat this, on the this. ground. Yeah. But it is a carpet, it's a mat. Uh, again, zero weeds because of just how this just intertwines and it just, mm -hmm. you imagine trying to be a weed growing in this. Yeah. <laughs> You're and, just gonna get sucked down into and, the canopy. And sometimes I'll put together and mix it for somebody uh, and they'll say, well, I, I just want vetch because I want all the nitrogen I can get. Well, that sounds good in theory, but in practice, I mean, the, the field or the, the mixture that we saw before because of the ability of the vetch to climb mm -hmm. um, exposes more leaf area to sunlight because all that nitrogen fixation is driven by photosynthesis. Yeah. And photosynthesis occurs because of leaf area exposed to sunlight. So if you give this vetch the ability to climb. Right, because these bottom leaves aren't getting anything. No. In fact, they're, they're falling off. They're just right. yellow and brown down below there. So if you can make a corrugated field yeah. like this. Way more surface area. Way more surface area exposed to sunlight. So you have the occasional uh, tall plant that the vetch can climb on. Same idea with cowpeas. Mm -hmm. and, and, you know, people say, I want a summer nitrogen fixer. Give me cowpeas or mung beans. I said, no, you want cowpeas with something. I'll put sunflowers in there. Yeah. I said, well, I don't want sunflowers. I don't want to pay for them because they don't fix nitrogen. I said, well... By having a few sunflowers in there, you get that corrugated canopy, more leaves exposed to sunlight. Yeah. And same way with adding a little bit of sedan. Even though they don't fix nitrogen, 
they give you that corrugated mm-hmm. canopy and some more diversity. And the amount of bees and butterflies and other birds insects and in here, birds is, the, of course they have the pivot they can set on right here and there's the fence row and whatnot, but it's, it's truly impressive how much, you know, biological life is here, yeah. uh, partly because it hasn't been disturbed. Uh, and we'll probably leave this, like I say, we may try to see if we can do uh, a little bit of a practice. You know, I always tell people, vetch is one of the easiest crops to grow. It's one of the absolute hardest, hardest ones to harvest <laughs> because it's very indeterminate. Uh, this this stuff will still have blooms on it, you know, two months from now. I, I have a lot of people say, I want to raise vetch seed. It looks like a gold mine. Yeah, they, they say that one, once. <laughs> <laughs> one year and, yeah. ah, I don't think I want to it's, do that. Yeah, yet. so, but I think if you want to raise vetch, and you have the ability to separate the seed. What we looked at before where the vetch and rye growing together is gonna to be way, way easier to harvest than this right here. Yeah. 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 Where the the birds that have this staked out as their territory are not happy with us right now. <laughs> yeah. so we're interfering with their bug hunting. Better let them get the 